Good morning, everyone. I am Heather Herring, Education Manager of NRRA, and I want to warmly welcome you to the prequel of our summer webinar series, since it is just one day before summer officially begins. This morning, we will delve into best practices for negotiating municipal contracts for waste, recycling, and composting part two. Next slide, please. Do you need professional credits? You will receive 1.25 hours of credit for New Hampshire solid waste uh, operators for attending this webinar. Webinars are recorded and made available for those who registered. Uh, you can complete the survey at the end and connect with NRRA and continue le your learning with webinars all summer long. You can visit our website at nrra.net. Next slide, please. For our operators, we have 10 webinars throughout the summer to choose from and learn. You can register on our website. Next slide. Uh, for our educators, administrators, and community members, we have 11 webinars to share. Although I list these two on two slides, all webinars are open to all. Next slide, please. I want to set the table for GoToWebinar. Uh, you will not be able to be heard by the presenters or other participants on GoToWebinar. If you cannot hear the presenters, click on audio and select computer audio. If that does not work, try clicking on phone call and follow the directions. We hope you ask questions and the presenters will answer them if time allows. You can click on the triangle next to the uh, chat section, uh, questions section. Click on questions and keep it short. Next slide, please. And now I would like to introduce the presenters of the best practices for negotiating municipal contracts for waste, recycling, and composting part two. Uh, Regan Bissonnette is the executive director of NRRA and Bonnie Bethune is the member services manager. Now I'm handing the presentation over to them. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Regan Bissonnette. Thank you for joining us for part two of our best practices for negotiating municipal contracts for waste recycling and composting. I hope that you all had an opportunity to join us on Wednesday where we went over um, part one. If you missed it, uh, that was recorded and you can get access to that um, and watch it at your convenience. My name is again, Regan Bissonette. I'm the executive director at NRRA and I'm also here with Bonnie Bethune, our member services manager. Good afternoon. And if, in case anyone didn't join us on Wednesday, uh, just briefly, the Northeast Resource Recovery Association is a recycling nonprofit, and we help communities manage their own recycling programs. And we are going to talk today about some of the things that we have learned over the years about how to negotiate contracts. So here's the information for part one in case you missed it, because we're not planning on um, repeating material today. So on Wednesday, we introduced general contracting principles. We also talked more specifically about contracts for municipal solid waste and source separated recycling. And today we are going to focus on single and dual stream recycling and composting in particular. And we'll be talking about how those general contracting principles we discussed on Wednesday apply to these particular topics. We will be taking a break about halfway through, uh, partway through for questions. And then we'll also have a chunk of time at the end to answer any questions that you have. So please do feel free to submit those questions as you think of them and then we'll answer those in batches when we pause. So to start off, we just wanted to make sure we've got some basic terminology down. Um, single stream recycling versus dual stream recycling. So single stream recycling is where all of your recyclables are going to go into one bin. 
Uh, and dual stream recycling is where residents are asked to separate out their containers from their fibers. And fibers cover things like paper, cardboard, magazines, newspaper. Um, those are the key distinctions between these, those two programs. Now, if you have single or dual stream recycling in your community, then you're sending your material typically to a materials recovery facility. So one more quick definition for anyone who might not be familiar with this, a materials recovery facility is a facility that processes and sorts single or dual stream recycling into the individual commodities for sale. Um, we do not have any commercial single stream MRFs, as we call them for short, located in New Hampshire. And there are not a lot of options for vendors who handle single and dual stream recycling in New Hampshire for that reason, but we do have some. And so we put together a simple map for you that basically shows how we've got a materials recovery facility located in Portland, Maine. There's a materials recovery facility located in Rutland, Vermont. And then there's several in the greater Boston area but none of them are located in New Hampshire. And why that's relevant is one thing you have to keep in mind is if your community is uh, using dual or single stream recycling in New Hampshire, then you're actually going to have to pay additional costs to have that material transported to the nearest single and dual stream facility. And I specifically mentioned New Hampshire because as I should have um, reminded at the beginning of this webinar, this webinar is actually being sponsored by the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And so even though we are welcoming people from inside and outside New Hampshire to participate today, we are gonna focus mainly on the New Hampshire focus since this is a webinar really geared towards uh, New Hampshire solid waste operators since DES is sponsoring this webinar. Reagan, do you mind if I chime in here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as there are MRFs as shown in the map, but there's also transfer stations in New Hampshire that will transfer single stream and dual stream materials to these facilities you're seeing on the map. So it, your material may not go directly to the MRF, it may go to another depot that that material is consolidated and then shipped in full tractor trailer loads down to these MRFs in other states. So there are some, again, transfer facilities that could bridge the gap and affect haul fees and so on. Right, yes, thanks for clarifying that, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Now, when we're talking about these sort of introductory definitions, you know, it's actually not quite so simple to just say, single stream recycling is all the material in one bin, and dual stream recycling is your containers separated from your fibers. And that's because there are various exceptions always. And one specific one that we wanted to make sure we talked about is single and dual stream recycling without glass. So we recommend that communities always make sure that they ask if there are any cost savings available if they remove glass from their single or dual stream. And that's because some materials recovery facilities actually offer financial incentives for removing glass. So one example that we have is that Stratford, Vermont, they pay $35 a ton to take their glass to a host site that NRRA manages instead of paying $121 a ton for the rest of their dual stream recycling. And Sometimes what you'll also find is that a materials recovery facility might give you a discount on the rest of your tonnage if you remove glass from it. So for example, um, we're familiar with a number of contracts where if a community removes their glass, they actually get a $5 credit uh, on the remaining tonnage that they send to that materials recovery facility. And some materials recovery facilities, they absolutely want your glass and they do not want you to remove it. And some of them really are incentivizing communities to remove their glass. So it's always worth asking. And then of course, you're going to have to crunch some numbers to see, would it be worthwhile for your community to go through the added effort 
of separating out in class. Now, when we think about contract negotiation for dual and single stream recycling, there's a number of key contract provisions that we're going to talk about. So certainly we're going to delve into looking at your costs, hauling costs versus equipment versus processing. We'll also be talking about contamination and residue and contamination audits, and then also looking at revenue and cost sharing. But first, we wanted to talk about markets. And this is really the only substantive slide from our Wednesday webinar that we're duplicating here because this is really important. In order to effectively negotiate contracts, it's really valuable to know your market and to understand um, what your options are out there and whether or not you're being offered a fair price. Because one, one of the questions we were asked by an attendee at the last webinar was related to how do you negotiate a contract that's going to be fair and transparent and um, both parties really feel like they're getting a good deal. And a big part of that is knowing that if you're paying the right price, so we always recommend that communities conduct market research before entering into any solid waste contract and certainly that applies to single and dual stream recycling now one example that we shared on wednesday was a, a community in new hampshire that actually saw a huge price increase for their single stream recycling and they wondered if that recent price increase was valid um, and the fact is we were able to do a fair amount of research for them and show that actually the large increase in pricing that they were being offered for their single stream recycling was actually in line with what we're seeing for market trends. So we've got some examples for you. Now, we'll start with national trends. This is a resource from Resource Recycling Magazine and they put out this great chart uh, a few months ago and it basically gives you over a period of roughly 10 years a look at what's happened nationally with both the average value of recyclables and the processing costs that materials recovery facilities uh, had to bear to process material and so what we see is if you look at the line that's sort of zigzagging all over the place that's essentially looking at what was the if you're look if you were looking at a theoretical average ton of material coming out of a materials recovery facility what was that material worth what was its financial value and so you can see that like the stock market the recycling commodity market kind of jumps all over the place but you do see that there's been a downward trend over the years and that's really related to limitations we've seen on export markets. So we saw that China issued what they called their green fence policy, um, which indicated that they were going to have some restrictions on material coming into their country recyclables. And then more recently, of course, we're all familiar with the challenges with China's national sword, which, re which further reduced um, prices. So, now what's happening is as the average value for a ton that these materials recovery facilities can expect to receive, as that value drops, they have also seen their processing costs increase. So that's the green line that steadily moves up. And you can see that it looks like according to this chart, it's telling us that on average nationwide, we were seeing that the average processing costs for a materials recovery facility increased from about $60 a ton back in 2009, all the way up to nearly $100 a ton as of 2018. And so then the question becomes, well, why is that? Why are we seeing those processing costs increase steadily? And what we see, this chart sort of breaks out for us um, what changes we've seen over those past 10 years. And what it shows us is that over time, there's a variety of different costs that have increased on average for materials recovery facilities. So the green is fixed costs. So we see that uh, many MRFs are having a larger footprint 
um, investing in higher technology. They have new, more stringent contamination limits that they have to meet due to China's national sword, and so that requires more cleaning. We also see in the middle that darker blue operation and maintenance. So we see that there's more machinery that they need. They've got aging facilities. And in order to meet more stringent specifications, they've had to slow down their lines. And then lastly, that light blue at the top is residue. Essentially, what is the material coming out of a MRF that they actually cannot sell? Something that they have to throw away. And some of that comes from people wishful, you know, wish recycling, wish cycling, putting something into their bin that can't be recycled. And as that amount of um, wish cycling increases, that in, in, increases the amount of residue that a facility will have to throw away and can't make money on. So while it's fine and good to look at national trends, certainly recycling is very much a local market. So it's really helpful to look at more local numbers. So for example, this comes from a great survey that the Northeast Recycling Council has done over a period of time. And what this shows us is that based on a survey of 18 MRFs in 11 states throughout the Northeast, this shows us if you were looking at what is that average ton of material coming out of materials recovery facility, it shows us what the rough breakdown is. So if you're looking at that average ton of material leaving one of these facilities, you see that on average in the Northeast, over half of that material is fibers. So that's your cardboard, your paper, your newspaper. Uh, about 15% is glass. And this is all weight, by the way, which is really important because plastic may take up a pretty decent amount of volume, but it's pretty light. And then you'll see that residue is actually the third largest by weight item coming out of these facilities. And remember, that's a cost for these facilities to dispose of that. And then lastly, you see plastic and metal. And what we will see here, so this is essentially what is the trends that we have seen? Again, what is that average ton of material um, priced at right now? And what you can see, I like to focus on the blue numbers. So the blue on the chart is showing the ton of average recyclables coming out of facility and showing them with residuals taken into account. So take factoring in the cost of disposing of that material. And what you can see is that starting in, you know, from April to June of 2019, we were seeing that an average ton of material coming out of these facilities was roughly $45, $46 a ton. And then you can see that it has dropped and is currently worth about $37, $38 per ton. Um, and what happens is because we're seeing less revenue during this down market coming out of these materials recovery facilities, that means that we see processing costs um, and tipping fees that communities are being charged increasing. And then here again, this is from the Northeast um, report. It shows that over time, the average processing cost per ton is increasing. Now I have to say the January to March number surprised me a bit. That's a pretty high increase. And that probably isn't really taking into account COVID-19 costs. Um, but what this is showing us, you know, based on the data that we have, is that on average, we were seeing that those 18 MRFs across 11 states are steadily increasing in their processing costs. But of course, these are just averages. Not all MRFs are created equal, and so costs could be higher or they could be um, lower. But this at least gives you a better sense of what's happening on average in the Northeast. So we've got some time for questions here, and I see that we've had one question coming in related to Stratford, Vermont. And it says, is Stratford, Vermont still paying $121 per ton for the rest of their dual stream materials, or is it lower because they are pulling out glass? Bonnie, can you clarify that one? Is the $121 taking yeah. into account any kind of a decrease? 
Um, absolutely. Um, I believe that is what they are paying now, which is $5 a ton less than if they would include glass. So if they were including glass, it'd be 126 a ton. So that's some incentive for them to take that material out and deliver it to uh, the host site at $35 a ton. So you can see that, that stark difference. Got it. And that's just one example of, of negotiating contracts that happens to be through NRRA. Now, if we have any other questions about that market information, um, please go ahead and ask those now. We'll pause for just a moment longer. Otherwise, what we can do is keep moving on and then save some time at the end to go over some of that information. Reagan, while you're waiting for some potential questions, um, I just want to let people know what they're looking at in the questions picture. Uh, this is a PGA host site and you're looking at the uncrushed glass that is collected from NRRA members at a site that NRRA manages with one of our municipalities working hand in hand. And what you see in the background is the actual crushed material, which is typically one inch minus. Um, and that is uh, our process glass aggregate or PGA that is available to that municipality that is the host site or to other municipalities to use that material for road base or um, drainage around culverts and so on. So it's one of my favorite pictures in recycling. All right, well, we don't have any other questions coming in right now related to knowing your market. So we will move on to talking about a variety of specific sort of contract provisions and considerations as you try to bring more clarity and sustainability to your single and dual stream recycling contracts. So I'll turn it over to Bonnie to talk about hauling and equipment costs. Okay, um, I apologize for not introducing myself better um, at the beginning, so I'm gonna do that for just a moment now. Um, I've been working with an RRA for 17 years in the office in Epsom, but have actually had the privilege of working with NRRA as far back as its inception in 1981, when I um, straight out of college ran the Wilton Recycling Center. So I've seen many sides of this industry, and I was impressed with NRRA back then, and I am impressed from the other side, um, looking out and enjoy working with members and helping them out. Hauling and equipment costs, if we're talking about contracts, um, the first thing you have to, one of the things that you would want to look at is are we going to buy our own equipment? Are we going to haul our own material to market? Whether it be single stream or dual stream or glass um, separated out from either of those, would it make sense to either use the equipment we have available to us or does it make sense to rent that equipment from our vendor? Um, we do have some examples of, of communities that take their single stream, um, particularly from southern New Hampshire, down into Massachusetts using 100-yard trailers, and they get an amazing amount of weight on those, 18 plus tons. Um, and then we have another example of a western ta uh, town, small town, that chose to own their own equipment and send that over to Portland in Maine. Um, they use an ejection trailer and get about nine to 10 tons on that load. So they made the investment in their own equipment. Um, and I like to think of this as being in somewhat more in charge of your own destiny, where you can be, if you don't have a contract, which you probably would with single stream, but you may not with dual stream, you would have flexibility in the market as to where that material would go. And one of the benefits of this in dual stream in particular is we have facilities that from time to time need to shut down. And during this pandemic, we've been very fortunate to not have that happen. But once in a while, there's maintenance that needs to be done. There's, uh, heaven forbid, a fire, which we have had a number of over the course of the last year. So the flexibility of having your own equipment allows you to take that material to another site. Um, 
it just might be more cost effective to look at it one way or the other, but I, I want people to be aware that that there are other options besides renting equipment and um, as part of their contract. If we go to the next slide is processing costs. Um, Reagan delved into that incredibly well as far as looking at what does it cost the actual vendor to process our material. This is very different from source separated material. We're depending at those facilities on our residents to separate for us as, as many times as we're asking them to do. Um, whether the plastic is put in one bin or the plastic is separated into multiple commodities but literally the residents are doing that for us. When we're asking, um, when we're doing dual stream, for example, that mixed paper and cardboard is separated at the MRF. Um, the cardboard is, is typically grappled out of that material and processed and baled and shipped out, mixed paper the same. In single stream, again, it's going over equipment, there is optic sort for the plastics, it, there is air blowing this, this jug and that container into different directions. Um, it's basically unscrambling the egg. So as you can see, the processing cost will go up. The more that that material needs to be handled, the more residue again that needs to be pulled out of that. Um, we looking at again, the range of $50 to $130 a ton for that material to go into these MRFs. Another thing I wanted to mention that as part of a contract, if you are going into one of the facilities in New Hampshire that is literally hauling their material down to, say, Massachusetts or into Vermont, then you're going to see higher costs for that material. And what that is, is building in that transferring cost from point A to point B into that price per ton. So that will be a little bit higher as they consolidate and bring that material to the other market. Um, processing costs may include administrative fees, rent, fuel surcharges, uh, utility costs, insurance, and that's the fine print. Um, being aware of a percentage of fuel surcharge, which may or not vary from time to time, from year to year, from month to month, um, it's important to know the nuances of all of those administrative fees. Uh, next slide would be con uh, contamination and residue, which we're talking a lot about, but it's in really important to understand um, what's going to be disposed of at the MRF. We have one community in southern New Hampshire that set very high standards on residue. They asked in their actual bid that the residue had to be, uh, I believe it was 10 or 15 percent only. That's a high ask. Um, given the numbers that we have seen. So they are trying to really understand what is happening to their material, where is each part of it going, and what is the residue um, acceptable in that material. So again, the residue is either going to be landfilled um, or incinerated out the other end, and of course we know those, those costs are high. Next slide, if any of you have ever been to a MRF, uh, what you're seeing on the picture is actually their nightmare. Typically plastic bags, any kind of film, any kind of banding gets wrapped around that piece of equipment which is literally supposed to be moving cardboard, plastics, glass, moving that along their, their um, their assembly line, so to speak, um, and it's not supposed to have material in it that gets all gummed up in the works. Um, they have to shut the whole system down. Somebody literally needs to get in there manually and cut all of that material out. So uh, understanding contamination, doing everything you can on your end to um, keep that contamination out in both the single and dual stream, is incredibly important to keep your costs down. There may be fees involved if what you're, your, what you're bringing in um, exceeds the limit that is in the contract. 
next slide would be sample contamination fee schedule. One of our um, vendors that we use for single stream actually shows that if you have three to five percent by volume, and when you have a hundred uh, yard trailer or 18 tons of material, um, it would be three to five percent of that, that by volume, not by tonnage, um, you would get a warning. And as you can see, as it goes up, six to 10 percent, $15. Um, when you get up higher over a, of 75 percent of your load um, being fine, but 26 percent of it or so um, being contaminant, then that whole load would not be worth it for that MRF to separate and it would be disposed of at the current gate rate, which we all know is up in well over 100, probably around $100 a ton uh, for that material. What this facility does do though is it gives report cards for each load. So the feedback is critical as to what is the material in there what can we focus on with our residents to keep that material out so that we can keep our contract um, safe and sound? Part of that is the contamination audit. So understand the audit process. What is the contamination fees that will be charged? Um, make sure that in the contract, both the municipality and the MRF agree on how that is determined and start with the accurate audit of inbound material for your municipality as a baseline. So you want to understand from day one, what is that material going in? And this is, this is particularly challenging, I would think, for curbside. Now in curbside pickup, a lot of times, nobody actually sees that until it actually gets to the MRF because it's picked up with the one arm bandit in a container that nobody actually goes and picks up anymore. Um, in, in some instances. So knowing what is expected of your residents, having them be very clear of what they can put into that material is so important. Um, and the municipality should have the right to observe the audit as to how it's done. Um, if I were working on a contract with a vendor, I would want to go and see what is their process, get some real hands-on sights and smells of how they do things um, so that I understand who's actually watching this um, and how that audit is done. So it's important to be clear in advance what the expectations are. So in case there's ever a, a misunderstanding or a dispute into how those fees are charged, then that can be avoided. Um, again, an example, the next slide would be the example of the contamination audit report um, showing different communities and this is this is a report card. Um, plastic bags, pool cleaner, heaven forbid, window glass, um, cat food bags, which would have the plastic liner inside of them. Um, it looks like Community C did really, really well. Um, somebody, some person, spent two minutes trying to find any contamination and found nothing. Hey, no contaminants. I would want to hear that if I were a community C. And community D um, has some, hmm, looks like mostly bottles and plastic jugs, which is okay, but there were some loose plastic bags, some bubble wrap, and styrofoam. So mostly good, a few things that they need to watch out for. Next slide would be revenue cost sharing. Understand and clearly define how revenue or costs are shared. And some of the charts that Reagan presented actually showed the trends of that. So the ideal is, and some, let me start. The ideal is, is sharing that revenue. I mean, we all hope that prices are going to get better for cardboard, that prices or costs for mixed paper are going to go back up and stay in the, in the revenue side of things because we know that six, almost 60% of the single stream is fibers. Um, floor and ceiling prices can provide some certainty. Floor pricing being the cost in the contract will never fall below a certain level. Ceiling prices, the cost will never go above a certain level. Municipal budgets are difficult enough. 
without having so much uncertainty involved with your contracts. Um, again, going back to our Wednesday discussion, what kind of things are in there that have to do with a pandemic. Next slide would be revenue cost sharing examples. So market average revenue, and you're going to see a lot of terminology that says the same thing. Um, average um, commodity revenue, um, blended ton, it all comes down to what is the actual, actual revenue after. The MRF brings in that material, separates it out, sells it on the marketplace, um, factors in their hauling fees, factors in their equipment maintenance, factors in their staff and benefits. What is, what is, actually no, I went ahead of myself. The average revenue per ton is the actual cost of what they get back for that material. And with a mixed paper being in such um, a cost, that is all part of that cost, that market revenue per ton. So the market average revenue less the monthly processing fee, which we talked about was, let's just say in the 120 ton range, um, is the actual, works out to be the actual revenue or cost per ton. So one example would be um, if the market average revenue was minus five, and the processing fee was 120, then the cost per ton would be 125 cost per ton. Um, and this is pretty, this is a pretty good average for what it's costing for single stream at this point. Uh, certainly there are contracts out there that are more favorable um, and are looking to um, come due and there's gonna be quite a sticker shock when they go into that. Hey Bonnie. Yes. We have a number of uh, great questions coming in, and there is one that's actually pretty relevant to this slide, so I thought maybe we could cover that one now. Um, but I do want to encourage okay. everyone to keep sending in those questions because we'll have time at the end. But someone asked, if your municipality gets information about their MRF's monthly uh, market average revenue per ton, and it shows much lower than what is presented in the NERC MRF survey that I shared earlier. What might we suggest to address this discrepancy? Um, one of them I've already mentioned, uh, the fact where is that material going? So for example, our Vermont town that we've noted, their dual stream and um, containers go into White River Junction. From there, they will be tra transloaded, transported to Rutland to go to the actual MRF. So I am thinking in that case, then that material that they have is not going directly to the MRF. Um, when we have a situation where we've got single stream going from our Western New Hampshire town to Portland, um, they are going basically what we call mill direct, they're going directly into that facility that is is processing that. There's no stop in between. Um, so it would vary from vendor to vendor, from market to market, and um, I, I, that would be my answer for that. Mm -hmm. Anticipate change. Um, Boy, if we're not nimble during a pandemic, we never will be. Um, pay attention to, again, certainly we want to pay attention to all of the details of a contract, but one of them is uh, minimum tonnage requirements. And anybody who has been in the industry long enough know that this, is, this has been more related to, an, to waste than it has to recyclables, but it could apply. So back in the day when you signed up with an incinerator, they wanted to know how many communities were coming in, and the communities would have to say, I am going to put 2,000 tons of MSW into that incinerator this year. If they did not put that amount in, they would have to pay for that anyway. So the incinerator was able to tell how much are we anticipating coming in, how many more municipalities can we take bringing material, um, 
just to be assured that they were going to cover their costs. This can happen in single stream as well. In contracts, um, watch for the minimum tonnage requirements that say put or pay. And why would you do that? Um, first of all, you've got to have some really clear numbers on what your history is. If you go to change something, say your community wants to do pay as you throw, that is a game changer. There is going to be less MSW and more recycling. So you want to understand your stream. Expect the unexpected. Who could have ever thought we'd be in a pandemic? That's an unexpected. Some of our communities actually shut down their facilities for a short time. Most of our facilities actual stop, actually stopped recycling for a short time, some for even longer. So all of a sudden, the material stream has changed. Uh, changing composition of materials. Um, what we've seen, and I had this discussion with one of my communities the other day, was that there is less glass and more plastic. And that's just a change in our waste stream that we're producing more. Um, and we're also, the light weighting of plastics is also changing things too. As you know, you can just squish a, a plastic bottle. It's very lightweight and that's, that's a trend. Um, so if, if we saw, we did have one contract that we, we were actually negotiating and we basically negotiated a way that put or pay clause because we weren't convinced that we could meet the mark of so many tonnage that they had anticipated. So we've spent most of our time today talking about dual and single stream contracts, and that's primarily because there actually aren't a lot of communities in New Hampshire that have contracts for handling their food waste for composting. But it's still something important that we wanted to talk about. And what I have here is a chart from the EPA, and these are the most recent numbers from 2017. And what it shows us is that on average, nationwide, the composition of municipal solid waste, which is just the waste that's generated from households, of course, this does not include commercial or industrial waste, nearly a quarter of, of what we generate could be composted, right? It's food, uh, food scraps account for about 15%, and then yard trimmings for another 13%. Now, of course, in New Hampshire, we ban yard trimmings from being landfilled. So many communities are composting yard trimmings um, at their facilities. But food waste is another matter. So we'll talk a bit more about that. Now, again, looking at some EPA numbers, just to understand the scope of this, only 6% of all the food waste in the US is estimated to be composted, and the rest of it is getting incinerated or landfilled. And this is a number that was quite surprising to me when I first learned it, but food is actually the largest component of municipal solid waste that is being landfilled. That's nearly 22% of what we are landfilling is food waste. Um, I find that to be a shocking number. What's interesting is a lot of people are very interested in where plastic falls. And I will mention that plastic falls as the number two most commonly, you know, largest amount of material landfilled at about 19%. Um, and again, this is by weight because so much of what we um, manage in terms of solid waste is measured by weight. Now, we absolutely recommend that communities explore whether composting food waste might work for them. And there's a number of reasons for this. I mean, one is the environmental reason, which is that when food waste uh, is put in a landfill, it doesn't really decompose um, and it creates methane, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, as it breaks down in the absence of oxygen. You know, of course, there's also moral reasons for um, wanting to avoid throwing away food waste. 
And that's because ideally we would be reducing food waste and then after that feeding hungry people, feeding animals, um, and even then composting, which is better than landfilling or incinerating food waste. Now in New Hampshire, there are actually rules in place that govern composting. And in particular, there are rules relevant to composting meat and dairy. And without going into a lot of the details here, many municipalities would have the option to request a waiver of the current rules that DES has if they wanted to compost meat and dairy. So as a general rule, unless your municipality has a very specific detailed permit that explicitly allows for composting meat and dairy, we don't actually see a lot of that happening in New Hampshire um, at the municipal level. Now what we do see, we do have some examples. So the community of Hollis actually is composting food scraps now this is food scraps without meat or dairy, and so they're composting on site. Um, and this pilot project was very successful among the residents. Um, residents really appreciated the opportunity to bring in their five gallon bucket of their food scraps and are really good about separating out the meat and dairy. And so that is actually getting composted on site in Hollis. Now, since we're talking about contracts today, Lee, New Hampshire, actually does have a contract for um, having their food scraps picked up through a service. Um, and this service allows them to include meat and dairy. So there are not a lot of communities in New Hampshire that um, have the option to have food scrap pickup service, compost service. But one of the benefits of those um, who are on the seacoast is that Mr. Fox Composting is a company that's based in Maine, and in Maine, their regulations make it um, more accessible for them to compost meat and dairy at their facility in Maine. And so Mr. Fox Composting actually serves much of the New Hampshire seacoast. It's my understanding is that they cover about, um, they cover about a one hour driving radius from where they operate. And for Lee, what Mr. Fox Composting does is they provide the transfer station with a few 64 gallon bins and signage. And then they come by and periodically pick up the material. And so residents just need to come. They can bring their food scraps that include meat and dairy. And they just put them right into these bins. And then periodically Mr. Fox comes and picks up that material and takes it over to their facility in Maine where they are able to compost it. And one of the handouts we provided actually does include a sample contract for composting. But interestingly, it's, it's the standard residential contract for Mr. Fox. They don't actually appear to have a specific contract available for transfer stations, but they do service transfer stations, businesses, schools, um, so if you want to take a peek at that sample contract, you can get a sense of what some of their um, what some of their services entail. And we actually did have someone submit a question in advance of the webinar asking this very question of who provides commercial composting services in southern New Hampshire and how is that done? Um, and one thing that I want to add is that when we talk about food scrap pickup like Lee, that is something that would um, require just an update to your operating plan. Um, and that would be something that you would notify to DES. So now we're really getting to what is, I'd say the most important part of the webinar, which is answering your questions. So we've had a number of great questions coming through in the chat and I encourage people to send in more because we wanted to make sure that we left plenty of time to go over your specific questions. So let's see. Bonnie, we had an interesting question come through related back to when we were talking about the example of a transfer station separating out glass. 
And this question says, should a transfer station that separates glass get more back from a MRF because glass is many times up to 20% of the load? So I think what this person's question is getting at is, why is a community only getting a maybe $5 per ton credit on the rest of their tonnage if they take the glass out? Um, and I can start by just saying that one of the challenges with how much financial value there is for a facility to take out glass, you have to keep in mind that dual and single stream materials recovery facilities, they were actually designed to take everything, right? They were designed to take glass. And so it's not quite so easy to say, well, if we just take the glass out, that automatically results in cost savings for the facility. It really is dependent on the facility. And we've actually seen that there is some variability. Um, there was a survey that I've seen. I don't believe it ultimately was released, but there was a sampling of materials recovery facilities asking them, how would your process, how would your tipping fee change if glass was taken out? And really the answers were across the board. Some said it would save them no money at all. Some listed this sort of $5 per ton. And then others said it would save them even more than that. So I think it really depends on the specific facility and how their operations are set up. Bonnie, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I would encourage people if they are under contract that they go back and revisit that contract. And I mean, Reagan and I saw a, a large district down in Massachusetts that was actually doing that. Um, that they were going back and starting a new contract, and that was one of the questions. Um, yeah, five dollars doesn't seem like a whole lot, but once you pull that out and you're only paying again the thirty-five a ton to take it elsewhere, then it does add up quite a bit. So that's really running the numbers. Um, yeah, I think as far as the the MRF, it's sort of half and half. Some of them were very were encouraging to separate it out and others were saying no way that's part of how we do things um so yes this has been with just in the last couple of years where this discussion has come up they one thing I, we didn't um talk about was the when a MRF produces glass it's very different from when a, a municipality produces glass because it's been through the process and what is left is this crushed material that has a great deal of fibers in it, paper. So you could almost look at the glass coming out of a MRF. It didn't really look like glass. So oftentimes that is not reused for any purpose. It's landfilled. Um, so I am thinking that the trend is going to continue where glass is going to be encouraged more and more. Um, is it still single stream if you remove glass? I call it single stream with a twist, and it's been happening for a while, but I, I kind of tend to see that trend continue to be more incentivized. Bonnie, we had a few questions come in related to audits, contamination audits. So the first question is, are visual audits and municipalities charged by ton? So if I remember correctly, the slide that you had up about audits actually gave an example where the audit was determined by volume, but is it correct that then the resulting charge was by ton? Yes, that is that good good call. Um, that would be very confusing, wouldn't it? Um, yeah, we'll have to check on on the clarity of that because it was it was by volume and you could see how that from a visual standpoint would have to be by volume. But how does that relate back to, to tons? That's a good question. Well, I mean, I can think of a specific example that we've seen when one of our host sites is measuring contamination related to um, glass that's being recycled. I mean, practically speaking, what may be the, the case is that when this material is coming into the materials recovery facility and someone is asked to look through and identify how much contamination it is, my guess would be it's probably easier and more practical for a worker to pull out contamination that they find, maybe put it into a, a bin or a tote or some kind of 
measurement by volume and then just translate that to you know a per ton charge i would just think that that might practically be easier than going through the trouble of actually weighing the contamination and actually as i'm talking i'm realizing probably part of the reason why they focus on the audit by volume is because some of the most as you said bonnie some of the most problematic contaminants they're very lightweight it's lightweight bags so you would have to have a lot of plastic bags and plastic bubble wrap and things like that coming through to actually weigh a lot but by volume those can be very destructive so i would think that that might be actually why audits may often be done by volume because of that lightweight plastic that's so detrimental so if we look back at our sample contamination fee schedule and it's six to ten percent then that if that load weighed 10 tons then they they would translate that to six to ten percent of the tonnage i'm thinking that's how it's done i think so i think so it's a good it's a good it's a good catch and then another question that came in was related to your comment the the example again the audit example that showed that someone had searched for two minutes to try and find contaminants and couldn't find any and so the question is do you think two minutes is enough time to audit 8.9 tons is that usual I thought that was quite a bit of time. <laughs> you think about all of the material that comes in, and you can tell a lot as it's spread out on the floor. It's typically, when a, when a truck dumps at a facility, it is spread out on the floor. It's not all in a hole, say, that you wouldn't see the whole pile. But as the truck empties and pulls out, then that literally is spread across. So you can, you can get a lot done in two minutes. I was actually surprised that it was that. Mm -hmm. Now, someone sent in a comment related to the Northeast Recycling Council MRF report that I had spent some time talking about and commented that the analysis is mostly from publicly private MRFs and dual stream. Um, Publicly private MRFs, that is a very good point, yes. So when the Northeast Recycling Council was reaching out to materials recovery facilities and asking them if they would share data, it was publicly owned, privately operated MRFs that were more likely to respond um, because since they have that public nature, I think they have sort of a, a duty to share that type of information and are more willing to share that information than um, a fully private materials recovery facility. So um, yes, that was a very good point to keep in mind. And so again, this is the best data we've got for the Northeast, and yet the devil's in the details, and um, it's really hard to say that that data is going to accurately represent any individual materials recovery facility because as we talked about for example processing costs alone can vary considerably from one facility to another so yes we're really just looking at, at averages um, and the best data that we've got and then we had a question come in about composting and wondering if composting can still make methane so this is something that i'd actually looked into before um, and, and for anyone who, who wants more information about um, composting and the regulations around composting in New Hampshire, I actually did do a separate webinar pretty much wholly on that topic back in September along with Mr. Fox Composting um, and talked quite a bit about the specific regulations for composting in New Hampshire. Um, and one thing that I had looked up related to that was well, yes, methane is produced when food waste uh, breaks down in the absence of oxygen, but is it also produced when you're composting, if you're properly composting? And the answer is a little bit. So there is a little bit of methane that is produced during the composting process, but very, very little um, if you're composting properly with air, with uh, um, oxygen. Um, compared to a much larger amount of methane that is produced if you are um, having food waste break down in the absence of oxygen in a landfill. Um, and as I'm sure many here are aware, things do not really 
decompose. They don't compost and truly break down in a landfill. You can throw a head of lettuce in a landfill and a landfill that's well operated is really going to entomb that material. And 25 years later, you can still dig out a head of lettuce. So um, yes, there's a lot less methane produced when you're composting food waste. And we've got a comment in, ah, Tara Albert commenting in, providing a bit more detail about the different permits and related to composting regulations. Um, and, and her comment was, um, the permit that allows for composting meat and dairy is a standard permit, which is a more detailed permit. And then there's also a permit by notification option where um, if a municipality has a permit by notification, they would actually have to uh, request a waiver of the current rules if they wanted to compost meat and dairy um, on site. And so those communities with um, standard permits, they're not eligible for a meat and dairy waiver. They would actually have to, I believe, modify their existing permit. And as I said, I went into a, this type of stuff in a lot more detail um, on a webinar back in September that's available on our website at nrra.net. So we've got some more questions coming in. Let's see. Someone asks, considering the hoops to jump through to do municipal composting, does it make more sense to encourage backyard composting in our communities? noting also that we have to pay staff to run the municipal composting system. Oh yes, absolutely. Without a doubt, the easier way for communities to reduce food waste going into landfills would be to encourage residents to compost, for sure. We didn't really go into much of that here because we are focusing on contracts. And fortunately, you don't need to delve into contracts if you want to work with your residents to reduce their waste. Um, but yes, there are many communities who participate in compost bin sales um, and do education for their residents. And look, we're in New Hampshire, so a lot of people have the space to compost relatively easily in their own yards, which is a real benefit of being in New Hampshire. Um, so absolutely, it's great for municipalities to encourage backyard composting by residents. Let's see, and then another person asked, with the current COVID-19 situation, are some towns just doing household trash and no recycling? Ah, Bonnie, I'll turn that over to you. <laughs> um, yes, we've been keeping a facility report and doing our best to keep that updated. Um, and there are, but more and more so we're seeing communities who were not recycling or stopped recycling uh, doing what they call a phase in. So they're phasing in cardboard, they're phasing in glass, and they're, they're tiptoeing back into full recycling um, with so many um, lines on the, on the driveway going in so that people stay in line. Um, requiring masks, staff wearing masks, so many of those things in place to continue to keep everybody safe. So are there some who are not recycling? Yes, but very few at this point. We're seeing more, more continue um, trying to get back to some sort of normalcy. And, and again, we were only aware of maybe two in New Hampshire that closed initially just because they did not have a plan in place and then in a few weeks reopened. Right. And we're certainly seeing that, you know, as Bonnie said, some places that did close or that just temporarily stopped recycling or temporarily stopped some recycling, um, that's really picking back up. I mean, we've actually had a very busy spring and now nearly summer um, at NRRA. We see a lot of communities that are seeing quite a bit of increase in material. 
So certainly municipal solid waste, there's been a huge increase in that because so much business waste is being diverted to households now. But we're also seeing that a lot of recycling that would have been going to businesses is being diverted um, to residences now. People are, you know, getting takeout and eating at home, you know, to the extent that takeout uh, container is recyclable. But also, and this is a really interesting one, we saw that the price of cardboard, um, the price of cardboard had been increasing for several months now. And that is because due to the pandemic, with businesses abruptly shutting down, there was suddenly a lot less cardboard uh, being recycled from businesses and there was a shortage in the market. And so we saw the price go up, up, up. And then finally the price got so good that anyone who was holding on to cardboard sort of flooded the market with it. And we saw the price of cardboard dip back down a bit in July. Um, but it just goes to show that right now in particular, household recycling is so important because you know, companies that rely on recycled material to make new products, they're really counting on that material. And so if it's not coming from businesses, we need it to come from household recycling. It was one of the first times in my experience that I didn't hear a mill or a vendor say, I've, I've heard them panic when they have too much material, but it was the first time I actually heard a mill just really kind of put a cry out for help because basically he was saying, how can we make all of these boxes that people are requiring us to make so that they can get their Amazon purchases if we don't have the cardboard to make it? And it, it really was a wake up call that, wow, this is affecting everybody all the way down the stream. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we have gotten through all the questions that have come in. If anyone has a last quick question, send it in. Otherwise, we are about ready to wrap up here. Um, and just want to say thank you all very much for joining us today, because this is a fun topic for me and Bonnie. Um, we talk recycling and markets and contracts a lot. I can't say we always have fun when we're talking about the contracts. It's actually quite a lot of work to design a contract that is going to stand the test of time and that you think is fair and um, that that is going to last you for a long time and serve you well. So um, we hope that some of the problems we've run into have um, helped you all and that we can share some of what we've learned. Well, thank Megan, you. I had just a quick thing to add. Sure. Um, when we're talking about indexes, they can be very confusing and it's not something that's in our normal day-to-day -day discussion. But, um, and I'm sorry for the feedback if everybody's hearing that. Uh, knowing, knowing your market, so um, good contract decisions are based on, on indexes oftentimes. So look at your resources. Um, ask your vendor who's responding to a, a RFP um, for some information about indexes and some historical information. Um, for example, NRRA keeps an overview of the PPI, the Pulp and Paper Index, which many even of our single stream uh, contracts are tied to. Um, so we have that resource on a one page that we could show you what has history shown the PPI to do. Um, so I think that's a, a key part of really understanding the indexes. Um, secondly, if anybody has any follow-up questions um, or would like to talk to NRA about any of these, please do not hesitate to uh, contact me and um, we, can, we can put you in touch with the right person or answer those questions directly. Excellent. Well, thank you, Megan and Bonnie, for such an informative presentation on contracts. Uh, we got to hear about national trends and local markets and audits. Um, I like some of the quotes that Bonnie had about uh, if we are not nimble during a pandemic, we never will be. So it really has shown our members uh, to be really active and, and ready to move uh, when needed. And I love when she talked about a single stream with a twist, referring to single stream 
uh, without glass. So uh, lots of tidbits, uh, lots of information about composting. Uh, so really appreciative. I want to thank our sponsor for this prequel to our summer webinar series. That's the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And remind everyone that a survey will launch immediately after this webinar. It will also appear in your email. We welcome the feedback and comments. Next slide, please. Next week, we will officially begin the summer webinar series and start with Recycling Markets Update with Chaz Miller. And then that's on Wednesday from 9 to 10 a.m. And then optimizing our recycling education and outreach efforts with Erin Victor on Friday from noon to one. Uh, please register and join us and share uh, this information on social media with your colleagues. Uh, thank you and happy summer from NRRA.